This is an F-100, uh, Super Sabre, the first of the Century Series fighters, the first uh, airplane we built in this country that would go supersonic in level flight. Uh, a miraculous airplane uh, for its time. Uh, we, we, we brought this airplane here because it had a combat record. Uh, this museum is, is created to, to house combat airplanes and to talk about the combat history of our Air Force. And so we've had F-100s here before, but not this model series. This is an F-100D model. Uh, this was the one that did most service in Vietnam. Uh, this is the airplane that had the combat record we wanted to have. And so it's very important to have this airplane here. Uh, the goal, of course, is to present to those people who come through the museum airplanes that have actually fought in different uh, uh, theaters of combat, and, and that's why this airplane was important. When the airplane was first designed, it was designed for an air-to-air, -air, air combat airplane, and also air-to-ground. It had the capability to do both. It had the capability to drop nuclear weapons. I mean, this is a weapon of destruction. It is an absolute weapon of destruction, and that's what it's designed for, and that's how we used it. A, a very broad range of missions assigned to this airplane as it came into the inventory. Uh, later in its life, uh, during the Vietnam War, this airplane uh, did not have the skill set, so to speak, of the F-4, for instance, so it wasn't really used in an air-to-air -air role. It was used in uh, ground attack, interdiction, uh, troops in contact support, so the majority of the missions that were flown with this airplane in Vietnam uh, were interdiction missions to uh, block the roads uh, from uh, in inflow of uh, munitions and people and equipment into Vietnam. Uh, close air support, when we had troops in contact, when the fight was hot, uh, this airplane was a prime airplane for helping to defend the troops on the ground. So it's had a, a, a very broad uh, range of missions during its lifetime, but during the later part of its life, it was mainly an air-to-ground airplane for dropping bombs, uh, strafe with 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter uh, weapons uh, and also uh, different sets of munitions. This particular airplane was built in 1956 and so the airplane was designed basically in that time period earlier in, in, the, in the late 40s, early 50s. And the last F-100 flew actively uh, sometime in the, in the late 80s, early 90s was the last operational missions that they flew, I think. When it came here, we, we took it off a pedestal up in, uh, in Massachusetts, and uh, it wasn't in great shape. It had a lot of corrosion, a lot of metal fatigue places where it had corroded away. So we've had to replace a lot of those pieces, a lot of those parts, and had to fabricate different pieces of material in order to put them on and make it uh, presentable in a museum. Uh, but that's been basically what I've been doing, is, is mainly sheet metal work. Uh, vacuuming out places that are full of bird remains and uh, sand from the from the de paint. Uh, it's a it's a long long list of things to be done. Uh, but this is for me a labor of love. This is an airplane that I have great affinity for. When this airplane was manufactured, the first place it landed after it left its uh, manufacturing plant in California was Robbins Air Force Base right here. It landed here to get some upgrades on it before it went on to uh, to Germany. Uh, for service in Europe. So that was its first arrival here. So it, it, its first operational landing point was Robbins Air Force Base, and so that, that's one of the keys. But for me, for my personal tie to this airplane, this was the airplane that I flew in Vietnam, this very tail number. Uh, of the 226 combat missions I flew, I flew about 180 missions in this airplane. It's, it's my titanium mistress. It, it's, it's what brought me home at times when it probably shouldn't have, when I abused it, when I did things uh, in order to survive, uh, punished it, and yet it held together. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an airplane that I have such strong feelings for. There's no way I couldn't bring it home uh, if I could. Uh, last mission I flew in this airplane was in September of 1969. Uh, left Vietnam, went home, and, uh, and never heard about the airplane again. Interesting story. I, I had a painting done by a, an aviation artist to paint my airplane in its battle garb, and he asked me if I knew what happened to it, and I said no, I didn't. But he knew somebody who did, and when I contacted that person, they told me where it was in Massachusetts, and that got the ball rolling. And I said, if there's any way uh, that we can bring that airplane in out of the cold and present it uh, to our museum uh, patrons in the, the combat uh, form that it was, uh, that would be my goal in life. Uh, and that's what we're working toward.
The Museum of Aviation opened in 1984, and it is an Air Force field museum. So it, it is part of the Air Force uh, museum program. Uh, the aircraft and other artifacts that are on display here are actually on loan to us from the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, the museum has the mission of telling the story of Robbins Air Force Base and, and the people and the missions. Uh, we have about uh, 90 airplanes at the museum, and uh, uh, well over half of those are inside our four exhibit buildings. We have had airplanes that fly into Robbins Air Force Base, and then we bring them down the highway and we bring them to the museum. The F-100D arrived at the museum in December of 2010. Uh, we had sent a team up to Massachusetts to recover it, and they loaded it onto uh, a semi-trailer and, uh, and trucked it down. And so the, the airplane was uh, on, on this trailer coming down the highway, it came into the museum, uh, was brought up to the back of the Scott hangar and taken off and brought into the hangar. With the F-100, because it was in such poor condition, we really needed to pull it apart, uh, at least pull off the wings, pull off the tail, uh, pull the fuselage apart, the major components, so we could give a good evaluation of the condition of the airplane. Uh, as we got deeper into it, we saw that it was in, 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 in bad shape. And so what that means is, is some parts we have, to, we have to pull off completely, and, and they're only good for the trash. We throw those, those pieces away. Uh, we have another F-100D fuselage here in, in the building that we have strictly for parts. And so we're, we're able to pull some parts off of that and then put them on to uh, 2995, which is the airplane that we're preserving. General Goddard's input as a combat veteran and as a pilot are, are absolutely invaluable because when it comes down to it, I mean, it is a, a, a fascinating piece of, of machinery. The technical information is going to be interesting to, uh, to many people, but when it comes down to it, what, what we are all about is people. It's the people stories. Uh, people want to know about what uh, our, our combat veterans experienced, and by having an airplane that flew combat and having the man who flew it in combat, we can make a very kind of a gut level connection for visitors. This man risked his life to f flying this airplane, doing, doing a mission that uh, has almost been forgotten and, and is certainly was unappreciated by many at home during the Vietnam War. So he, it's an opportunity to, to tell, to, to, to very much personalize the story. In January 9th, 1962, I was assigned to the 20th TAC Fighter Wing at RAF Station Weathersfield in England. And, um, and uh, they immediately sent me into test flight section. And one of the airplanes that I worked on was 995. My cousin saw it in Air Force Magazine. He saw the restoration job with a picture of the general standing in the uh, gun bay door right there. Well, when I saw it, it sounded so familiar to me, and I went through a box of papers I had, and I came up with our actual 1962 inventory list, and this airplane was on it. So I got all excited because I just absolutely always loved the F-100. Um, I worked on a lot of airplanes, but the F-100 has just been a, a true love my whole life. As bad as that looks, that airplane is as beautiful as it has ever been. Um, it just always was. When they put this in the museum, it will be the showstopper for the whole thing. I'm sure that this will be the center of attraction. Through all of the uh, experimentation and, and, you know, and, and just the evolving of aviation and the evolving of the turbine engines, the evolving of airframe, the evolving of aerodynamics, a major, major part of it is this airplane right here. And one of the very significant things is this is the first operational supersonic airplane. This is the first airplane that could fly in level flight and break the sound barrier. And it was the very first one. That is extremely significant in aviation. In order to get to Mach 2, you have to get to Mach 1. There's your Mach 1 right there. I wish I could intellectually come together with how this airplane and I arrived here, uh, a number of circumstances. 
I spent 34 years in the military, and in those 34 years, I don't remember a day I didn't want to go to work. And it was because of this kind of equipment and the people that I worked with that made uh, it such a rewarding experience for me. Uh, and so my, my thrill right now is to be able to present an airplane that I have such a relationship with, as I said, my titanium mistress, that I can now share with others and let them see what this airplane did and all the people who put it together, who designed it and manufactured it and made it available to the American warfighter is a story that we ought to be awfully proud of.